Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Education's Digital Future, Equity by Design. I'm Angela Estrella, and I'm an instructional coach for the Center to Support Excellence in Teaching, and I'm also a team member for the initiative that's supporting this uh, seminar series. I'm really excited about tonight's session, broadening access to high-quality teacher professional learning. Teacher professional learning is a topic that I'm really passionate about, and tonight we'll explore what we know about effective professional development and how technology has the potential to leverage the characteristics of effective professional development. We encourage you to tweet using our hashtag EDF equity during tonight's session and we have a couple of questions for you so there'll be some audience participation and we encourage you to tweet uh, your responses using the EDF equity hashtag. Um, we're more than halfway through the seminar series. We're uh, in week six, which is really exciting. Um, how many of you have attended two or more sessions in our seminar series? Wow, that's fantastic. How many of you are here for the first time? Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you for joining us, um, be becoming part of our community. In fact, um, I want to share with you a map that we, um, I've been working on, and we'll have a fuller version to share. Um, there we go. So over the course of our seminar, seminar series, we have had educators, administrators, and board members from all over the Bay Area participate, um, representing over 35 schools um, as far as uh, Richmond um, all the way down to Morgan Hill. And 20 of these locations represented on this map here um, are for educators who are taking this course uh, for continuing education units. So let me go back to my slide deck. Educators taking the course, like Melissa Brown. Um, Melissa is a K-5 visual arts teacher at Brentwood Academy, which is in the Raven School um, uh, school district in East Palo Alto. She's a national board certified teacher and has 16 years of experience teaching visual arts to elementary and high school students in Michigan, Florida, and California. We also have educators like Martha um, Campos Lopez. And, um, she's another educator participating in this course taking continuing education units. Martha is an instructional technology specialist for the Berryessa Union School District in San Jose with um, over 28 years of experience using educational technology. Melissa, you just missed us sharing. <laughs> okay, fantastic. <laughs> we'll be sure to connect with her later if you haven't yet. <laughs> um, you know, Martha is passionate about using educational technology and that was what brought her here through her work in that she sees how you can amplify, um, how educational technology can amplify the amazing teachers that she's worked with um, to raise the achievement level. Um, so how, how do we spread, my question for us to think about tonight is like how do we spread the expertise of educators like Martha and Melissa and how do we create more leadership opportunities for the teachers like the ones that Martha works with? All right. So I, I didn't share to you, Elizabeth, I was going to have a picture of you as well. Great picture. <laughs> Over the course of the past six weeks, we've heard from a number of researchers and thought leaders in education, like Molly Zilzinski and Shelley Goldman, who shared, um, shared findings from the report they co-authored with Linda Darling-Hammond about, uh, about using technology to support students' learning. Uh, we learned integrating technology for learning is like a game of double dutch. Um, we need a plan for technology integration that includes purposeful alignment where all parts of the digital learning ecosystem are considered. And then last week, we had really inspiring um, speaker, Daryl Adams, who talked about how you implement such a plan and the leadership that's required. Um, you know, Daryl talked about not only thinking outside the box about there is no box, right? So. He shared his inspiring story of innovation in the Coachella Valley Unified School District. And then we had Elizabeth Brumbaugh, who provided a regional perspective of professional learning opportunities in the area and working towards bridging gaps of understanding about integrating technology in the classroom. During Elizabeth's presentation, she asked this question that I have thought a lot about and it stuck with me throughout the series. 
She said it's a conversation about access to tech or access to high quality professional learning for teachers. And so you know, as an instructional coach for the Hollyhock Fellowship Program, which you're going to learn more about tonight from um, colleagues I have here, um, I've, I've seen that, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to work with teachers across the country from New York to Mississippi to Texas, Southern California, and I see that I've noticed differences in access to high quality professional learning opportunities, as well as um, the number of district-wide initiatives uh, they're all called upon to enact. And so tonight we're going to discuss what are characteristics of high quality professional development and what is the potential for technology to broaden access to high quality teacher professional learning. And so not only does technology have the potential to broaden access to high quality teacher professional learning, it can also be a lever for creating new opportunities for teacher leadership and for teacher leaders to share their practice. So I have a question for you. So this is first part of audience participation. I want you to turn to your neighbor and, and share your thoughts about this question. And so hopefully you're close to an educator, you can um, share your experience even in your organization. What opportunities for teacher leadership are, about, are available at your school organization? So meet someone new, turn and talk to your partner, and I encourage you as well to um, hash, uh, use our hashtag to tweet out your response. Okay, we're going to come back. It would be great, too, for some of you. Um, please tweet out your responses. You'll have more opportunities. Hopefully, uh, you'll get to talk to someone new in our, with our second question, and we'll also have more time to connect during the campfire chats. Uh, you know, traditionally, there's very limited options for teacher leadership, right, outside of the classroom. Um, a very wise person told me early on in my career, who I'm surprised is not here, she said, Angela, don't become an administrator. <laughs> uh, and uh, administrators do really incredible work, but you know, as a, a classroom teacher, very limited opportunities outside, right? Um, or, or for teacher leadership in which you could still stay in the classroom. And so and this is where I think we have real potential about how we can leverage technology, is if we can think about how we can build teacher leadership 
um, throughout their career in which they stay in the classroom. So using um, teacher leadership uh, to, to have new opportunities. When I look across this, um, the audience here, I see many people who played an important role in my own teacher leadership, many people who I met online through my personal learning network, um, the Crowd Center of Innovation who encouraged me to make my, pa uh, my practice public in, in using educational technology. So tonight, one, when we really think about the potential for technology when it comes to professional learning is thinking about how can we create more opportunities for teacher leadership and, and not only teacher leadership, but the ability to share that practice to make our practice public. And so, you know, it, it makes me think about, I was an early adopter of using educational technology in the classroom. And I, I had to seek out ways in, uh, of connecting with people just because I, I didn't really know what I was doing. Oh, see, everyone, I, I'm sharing these stories. Melissa came in late, Martha, and now Lynn. So we'll, you'll have to watch the tape for this one. <laughs> um, okay, but in terms of, um, I got dubbed this, we hear this phrase a lot, the teacherpreneur, and what does that mean? I've always said that I think teachers are real entrepreneurs. Like in our classroom, we're constantly making iterations. And so when we think about technology, again, is how we create opportunities for leadership. You know, you, you think of the hacks that we have. And I really think about, you know, there, there's been a flood of tools about how to make technology, um, or, or tools, technology tools to make uh, professional learning more efficient. But I really think it's the teachers, like teachers here, in, in the audience tonight that are really going to produce or create the tools that will lead to, to lead to high quality professional learning. So something to think about. And now I, I want to turn it over to my colleagues and introduce them. I'm really excited um, tonight to, to introduce, let me make sure I have this here, Janet Carlson, who's a co-lead for TELOS along with uh, Bridget Barron. And she's a, uh, Janet is an associate professor here at the Stanford Graduate School of Education. And she's the director of the Center to Support Excellence in Teaching. She began her career as a middle and high school science teacher and has spent the last 20 years working in science education, developing curriculum, leading professional development, and conducting research. And I'm um, excited to introduce Tammy Wu Moriarty, a um, colleague of mine um, at CSET. Tammy is a professional development associate for CSET. Um, Tammy focuses on conducting professional development with high school science teachers for the Hollyhock Fellowship Program, as well as many other CSET programs throughout the Bay Area. Her experience includes being a secondary science teacher, a district science resource teacher, and school administrator. Her experience includes being, um, sorry, got excited to introduce <laughs> um, our next speaker too. Um, Sadie um, Skiles. Sadie is a, a teaches biology and biotechnology at Oakland Technical High School. Um, before that, she taught eighth grade physical science at Kennedy Middle School in Redwood City. And Sadie is a 2014 Hollyhock Fellowship Program, which I know you're all really excited to learn more about that because I've mentioned it several times now. And she's also a mentor teaching fellow for the Trellis Education, a STEM teacher education and professional learning program. I'm really excited um, for them to present on how you can use um, technology um, for uh, professional learning. And so first up, I'm going to have Janet Carlson talk about some of the characteristics of what we know about high quality professional development. I'm gonna go back one slide because I wanna emphasize a, a few things from what Angela said in our um, introductions. What's very exciting to me about the work that we're gonna talk about tonight and hopefully provoke some questions with you is the way that our work intersects from the professional development associ associate work that Tammy and Angela do to Sadie who began with us as an early career teacher and is now definitely a teacher leader and making a difference both in CSET and beyond. We're happy to share. Um, and then my work, which kind of sticks in the geeky research stuff and holds the center accountable for doing things that matter and build on other work. So between the four of us, we represent the multifaceted approach for thinking about how to leverage technology in high quality professional learning experiences for teachers. 
We're all coming from this lens of CSET, the Center to Support Excellence in Teaching, which is based in the School of Education here. And I just wanted to spell out the acronym because you're going to see it a bunch tonight. And it's really about this pursuit of excellence, which we define in terms of student learning. We're a center focused on teaching, but what difference does teaching make if it doesn't result in learning? Our mission is to improve instruction and develop leading teachers who can positively impact student learning and the teaching profession. It's not a surprise to any of you that the U.S. is not a place where teaching is a high status career. And we actually believe it should be the highest status career. Teachers make a difference in kids' lives. They're the mo single most important factor after the things that happen in home. So we need to invest in teachers, we need to invest in the quality of that profession, and we need to honor that profession and the people who work so hard. So that's a big part of how the center approaches our support for excellence in teaching. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, how we do it is represented in, in this graphic. We have a cycle that's not entirely linear, but I'm somewhat limited by what graphics can do, where we design and develop, we research, and we disseminate. And there's a bunch of crisscrosses in all of that. And we're doing it from the lens of transformative professional learning. We want professional learning experiences that really challenge teachers, administrators, and indirectly parents and kids. We want kids to go, whoa, what is this teacher doing and why? And our two focus areas, as you've probably picked up by what I've been saying so far, teacher leadership and instructional improvement in order to really make a difference in student learning and ideally to retain good teachers in the classroom. The more we churn teachers, the more we hurt kids. So we want to bring up the quality of what's going on in the classroom and we want to keep those people in the classroom. For those who want to pursue an administrative track, we're all about great teachers becoming great administrators. But that's not the leadership position that fits everyone. And one of the things I think you'll really enjoy hearing about is Sadie's story and how she's emerging as a leader. Um, I'm hoping to embarrass her just a little bit because I don't know that she thinks of herself as quite the leader that we do. But she is. All right. Before I get into, let me tell you a little bit about the research. Let's get your heads into the same space. So Angela, the non-science teacher, hates my graphics, but I want you to use your brains, <laughs> turn to a neighbor, can be the same one you already talked to, can be a different one. What do you think counts as high quality professional development? Okay, I hummed the Jeopardy theme twice. Finish your sentence. Ah, being the good educators you are, you have very long sentences. <laughs> All right. I want to hear a couple of ideas. What counts as high-quality professional development? Who's got an idea they're willing to share in a very succinct fashion? Just a phrase. Okay, linking ivory tower research with those real ro world classrooms. Yes. Uh, to whom or what? To the receiver of the professional development. Ah, okay. All right. Okay. So that I'm actually working with the people who are in the room, <laughs> right? Not who I thought might show up. Okay. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Okay, yeah, if we cannot connect the dots between the PD program, what the teacher's doing, and what the kids are doing, how do we claim it's high quality? Yes? And the job should uh, get into all of us, so it can't be my professional development, it should be ours, so that I have the intent to learn and then share 
Okay, so a community aspect to it? Wonderful. One, back there and then here and then we'll, we'll move on. Okay, teacher agency and choice? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. So you're particularly thinking about whole school faculty come to this PD. It better have something that matters going back to each classroom. Okay. All right. Great. Let's see how our craft wisdom stacks up against a synthesis from the literature. How good do you think you are? Yeah? Okay. High quality or effective, and remember we're using that, it links to student learning as our de working definition here. PD is driven by a vision of a classroom where all students are learning. I actually heard that in numerous examples. It's practice based and helps teachers develop knowledge and skills. I could stretch a couple of your answers to get there. Um, you didn't literally say those words. Builds a learning community. We heard that one over here. Develops teacher leadership. And that's, this is a really broad definition of leadership. It's that interest in staying in the profession and leading leading the conversations with parents, leading what's happening in your classroom with kids, leading with your colleagues in the same department or layers beyond that. It's contextualized. Again, several of the answers pointed out to that and links to the system. In other words, if you're in a district in a state with very high stakes, high stakes testing, the PD has to link to that. It has to acknowledge it. This one I'm actually surprised didn't come up, and it may be because I just didn't get a chance to call in enough people. It's got to be of sufficient duration. It cannot be hit and split. Um, and I'm seeing some nods, so I suspect some of you may have sat through hit and split and you kind of wonder, eh, what now? And you, part of the reason for the duration, there's multiple reasons. For tonight, I linked it with only one idea, and that's the, to allow for coherence. In other words, for the chance for ideas to develop over time, to put them into practice in what, how lesson planning and instruction play out in the classroom and an opportunity to see what students are learning. And it needs to be continuously assessed, which came up over in this comment. So the red tonight is simply to highlight ideas that you're gonna hear when Sadie and Tammy come up and unpack a particular experience. It does not mean those are any more important than the others, but I wanted to draw your attention and foreshadow those ideas. You might have noticed in my little diagram, my schematic about what CSET does, it is particular that we're trying to do something transformative. In other words, we don't just want to add on to what's going on, we actually want to rattle cages and have people step back and ask hard questions of themselves, of their practice, if the right trust is there of their colleagues. So we take all those effective char characteristics of effective PD and we want to say, okay, now we're going to put them together and make it transformative. We've got to create cognitive dissonance. We've got to, that's that rattle the cage. Something, you have to be dissatisfied with something you kn think you're already doing. Um, there needs to be plenty of opportunity to, to resolve that dissonance. That cognitive dissonance and the process for resolving it has to connect to the teacher-student. So that's all that stuff you guys were saying about context and relevance. A repertoire of practice to support the new understanding. We can't just say, go have a sense-making discussion. You need actual instructional moves for how to make that happen. Have a sense-making conversation that is equitable for your students so all students have an opportunity to contribute in non-trivial ways. Again, that involves some instructional moves that you may or may not be doing, but you've got to step back and figure out if you are, and if you aren't, what do you do? And this has to be iterative, and that's back to that sufficient duration to give yourself time to develop these ideas and the practice to put new understandings into play in the classroom. And I didn't make all this up. I'm drawing it from other people's work. So when we try to put these things together at CSET, we've decided that we're really going to keep teachers' practice at the center of our work 
And in order to do that and design professional development, there's four different components that we're pulling from a couple of different um, lines of research. One is that teachers need representations of what practice looks like that results in student learning. Those representations could be on video, could be by visiting a classroom, um, could be modeled by the PD provider. They need opportunities to take that practice apart, to decompose it and look at it and figure out what went into it. That could be a guided decomposition with a PD leader. That could be something a PLC does. It could be something an individual does um, with a little bit of prompting. They need time to approximate these new, uh, excuse me, new practices. One of the strategies we're using the most is a technique called rehearsals, where our teachers in the context of PD rehearse a new set of moves, for example, the sense-making discussion moves, and they practice with their peers who act like really nice students. Um, and then they need instructional support. There are a lot of ways to provide instructional support. The model that you're going to hear Sadie and Tammy elaborate on is a coaching model that's video-based, and um, they'll unpack that a little bit further. But all of these different components contribute to a practice-based approach to high-quality PD. So you thought you were at a technology seminar, right? So when the heck am I going to mention technology? I want to put technology in the context of these characteristics of effective PD. You can't quite see it, but the, the beige one at the top says vision. And we think of technology as having the potential to leverage all these characteristics. And so if it works really well, this lever, all these things that we could do in PD gets raised up by the affordances of technology. Some of those affordances include asynchronous interactions, the opportunity to revisit materials, the opportunity to share materials easily. And here's some examples from inside the School of Ed, some of which you may have heard of. So I want to be clear, while we're going to dive deep into one example tonight, it is not the only example. A couple more experience, affordances of technology include the opportunity for a common experience. Teaching is a very isolated profession. We don't get to see each other teach. It's a rare opportunity that you can arrange some kind of subsystem or principal taking your class and go see what a colleague's doing. Well, it turns out with some technological tools, we can share practice within a building, across the country, around the world. That also makes it really easy to share representations of practice, going back to that um, combination of squares that I showed that informs this um, CSETS model. It's very e easy. It can be very safe because of some of the um, guards in um, how some of the technology uh, platforms work, and you can look at the same thing repeatedly. So these are all things we can't do when we go on human memory or just a classroom observation. As you all know, technology is not without its downsides. So it can work against what we're trying to accomplish, but that's ideally not what we want. And in order for technology's affordances to come to the foreground, we found there are really three pieces um, that have played very strongly in the um, evaluation data from the teachers that we're getting when we ask them what's working and what's not. They have to trust each other. They have to feel that their video component is going to a safe place that won't be used for evaluative purposes, won't be shared inappropriately with someone they don't want to see it. And they need relationships with each other and with their coaches. So with that, I want to help you dig into an um, example by introducing Tammy Wu Moriarty again, and we'll make all that ivory tower research stuff come to life. Thank you. So I'd like to share some details about the Hollyhock Fellowship Program. So we have four goals in the Hollyhock Fellowship Program. The first is to improve instruction by focusing on carefully selected set of core practices. We also um, work on strengthening pedagogical content knowledge as well as disciplinary content knowledge. Um, and we develop equitable learning opportunities for all students and we build professional community. And in Hollyhock, professional community is on several levels. 
we have uh, Hollyhock teams come um, with a group of teachers from their school site, so there's a team level. Then there's a content area because Hollyhock serves um, English, science, history, and math fellows. And so there's also the Hollyhock overall program where teachers across disciplinary uh, disciplines can interact with each other. So currently we have 294 fellows all across the country. You can see the breakdown on the map. Um, we have 103 school-based teams and we're serving over 60,000 students and we continue to grow as we add new cohorts. So when the fellows come, they spend two weeks with us in residence. Um, each summer they live here at Stanford University. Um, and this is where we begin our community building, where we get to know each other, they receive intensive professional development, um, we spend a lot of time with each other. And then throughout the school year, we engage in online coaching sessions throughout the year, and the online co coaching sessions um, are a mix between individual um, touches with fellows as well as content teams and school-based teams. So something about the coaching. So how has technology um, helped me build relationships with my teachers that I work with and challenge teachers' practice and support teachers in changing practice to increase student learning? Well, first, um, the teachers are able to upload their classroom um, videos onto a platform, and I'm allowed to see and hear and enter a teacher's classroom. So even though I can't be there physically, I'm there virtually. Um, sometimes working in the very same classroom where I'll get to know from a coach's perspective the names of the teacher's students that he or she is working with. Um, it also allows me to communicate with the teacher in very specific and focused ways. So the teacher can tell me, here's my video. I have a 15 minute clip of a classroom discussion. Here are things that I'm really struggling to work with or here are questions I have. And when you watch the video, I would like you to focus on certain aspects. So now I have a lens as a coach to go in and make, ask questions, make comments, point out things that I see. And then the teacher has the ability to write back to me, think about the questions, either write back here. And then later we have a conversation um, where we do a video conference and we talk about the video clip and we talk about the questions that were raised and next steps and what should be done. Um, the focus is on student learning. So the video allows for us to refer directly to what students are saying and what they're doing. Um, and this is done over a stretch of time. So um, I've been working now with Sadie for almost two years. And so I've been in and out of her classrooms for the last two years with her students and we've been focused on a particular set of core practices and so through time we can actually go back to our videos and say remember when you know we first started out and now look at where we are and what we're looking at so um, so this is from my perspective as a coach how this has really helped me um, build relationships and maintain that that um, the over the time the consistent let's see what's happening in your classroom based on what we did in the summer but I think that um, I'd like to give you an, Sadie an opportunity to tell you what she thinks um, as her perspective as a teacher in the classroom. All right, thank you guys for letting me be here. Um, it just makes me feel better all around that things like this are going on all the time. <laughs> people are thinking about it and people are trying to make this um, better. So. I guess where I wanted to start with um, how Hollyhock has transformed my practice. Um, first of all, I, I guess it has been two years now. It doesn't really seem like it's been that long, but um, it has increased my self-confidence in my teaching um, immensely. After your first two years of teaching, um, when you're done with all the like credential programs and whatever, nobody really observes you that often and they don't really observe you unless they're trying to decide whether to hire you again next year. So you don't get a whole lot of targeted feedback. So this program came at a really great time for me when I was in my third year of teaching. Um, and in my third year, so this was the summer after my third year of teaching and I learned some really targeted um, 
effective strategies for being a better science teacher. But it didn't stop with the summer, and that was what was so great about this program. Um, what I really appreciated about this program specifically, and here being at Stanford, is everything was grounded in research. Not only that, then it was modeled for us. So we would get the theory behind it, and then we would have our session coordinators and our coaches model the strategies for us, and then we got a chance to try it. Um, and the cohort of teachers um, that I came was probably one of the biggest benefits. They were all really enthusiastic about teaching and wanting to grow their practice, which is if you've been in a normal public high school, you don't always find that with all of your peers as teachers. So to be here in a group of such enthusiastic teachers, that alone was really great. Um, so we got to know them and talk about strategies in person, which was really important for me. But then we all go to good PDs and we dream and we plan. But then I had a coach who kept me accountable for the implementation, implementation of these strategies, which was really great. Um, and it wasn't just, you know, one time. We repeated these cycles that were mentioned earlier. And that was really helpful. We would start by planning a specific strategy to focus on. And like we would talk about this beforehand, either by email or whatever. And then I would plan the day I'm going to film it, and I would film it. We would, um, this would be the way that um, she was able to come to my classroom without actually being in my classroom. So we would, I would upload my video, and then we would have the conversation, um, how to go, next steps, what went well, what didn't go well. And... This was another really great part of this because it focused on my practice, like growing my practice from where I was at. It wasn't a like blanket, this is where everyone should be by the end of this year, or everyone should try this. Every fellow had a different focus. That was really great. And this, over time, just made me a lot more comfortable with having an open practice. I could share videos, I could have people come and observe. It was... Like, it began to be a feeling of, like, oh, it's, it's for me to be a better teacher. It's not for me to maybe get hired or not hired back or something like that. It was just based on me wanting to grow my practice. So it was just about, I was just as grateful for the observations um, as the feedback. Um, and that is one of the most important parts about this. It changed the feeling of, like, what observations would be. Um, and now I seek that out. So anytime anyone wants to observe or I have a chance to share, I always get something out of it. And this would just make me more open to trying new things because, once again, like the whole experience felt like it was a positive thing. And this, of course, leads to teachers liking their jobs more. It allowed me to feel not only to feel better at it and more prepared, but once Hollyhock has ended, which I am sad to say is going to be soon, I know what this cycle for Im improvement could be, and I could do this with my fellow biology teachers. We could implement this in our PLC, and I know how to apply this to new situations or new things that we'd want to learn. Okay, the next and most important part about this was, and this is where I think that... Um, Technology can enhance things like this, but it's never going to take the place of, like, in-person um, interactions. Because if you don't trust the people who are watching your videos and giving you feedback, then you're not going to trust their suggestions either. So relationships um, build trust. And you have to, in my opinion, you have to spend time with people, like, in person to get that. And not only that, you get to know what their experience is, their background, how they collaborate. And you just, like, you learn to value their feedback specifically. Um, and then it's really easy to take risks, like share your practice with them, get feedback from them, give feedback to them. So the Hollyhock program was great in that sense. Um, in the summer, the top picture is just the science cohort mostly. But this could apply to the whole teacher cohort in general. Um, and that really set the stage for the work we were going to do during the school year, was the trust that we built. Um, and then, okay, so now technology. How, how did technology help this whole process? 
the technology component was key because everything that we learned during the summer, like I said, when you're there at professional development and surrounded by all these enthusiastic teachers, you have, you make big plans. Um, but then during the school year, with the technology component and the coaching conversations where I would plan what do I want to try and then film it, you get that gentle push to, okay, you're going to implement this like within the next month instead of, you know, sometime in the future. And then that, I would say, sped up the arc of my practice growing because I had the gentle push of my coach. Her email would pop into my inbox saying, what do you want to focus on next time? Where are we at? When's your video coming? So that was just the encouragement to um, try something sooner, then get feedback, try it again, get more feedback, try it again. So it just sped up the arc of improvement, like how fast I was able to try new things and see the results. Um, so this, the teacher-coach partnership being throughout the school year, like I said, this was huge because there's a million and one different things going on during the school year, but that's, that's when you have a chance to implement these new strategies is during the school year. So if you've been teaching for a while, you already have some plans, some unit ideas. What is going to push you to shake that up? Well, my coach was who pushed me to shake that up. Um, and then nothing lies, or I mean, videos can't lie. So <laughs> when, it's, when you're thinking about in your memory, reflecting on things and then you watch the video again, you're like, oh, didn't catch that. Or um, not only does it allow you to like, your hindsight is 2020 kind of thing, but then you can go back and replay it for things you may not have noticed or things you want to improve next time. You, you always have that video file there to refer back to. So it can inform more things about your practice. Things will come up that you didn't mean to focus on. Um, and that, that is also a really great component of technology. You have a record of that. And then this part was, this was one of the parts that I really enjoyed a lot. Um, the teachers that I met, the community that I met at Hollyhock has been one of the things that I know will last as far as me being able to improve my practice and having a great community. And it was really great to be able to collaborate with them in the same way that my coach could collaborate with me. So we watched videos of each other, and I would love to go to their actual classrooms, but it is kind of hard to take a day off of teaching to do that. So we would collaborate on a focus, and then film a lesson, and then watch each other's videos, and then have a conversation with our coach, where we are all there um, in a video chat after we've watched everyone's videos, and we've also tagged all their videos so that um, if they had clarifying questions, we could answer them via the tagging. So when we get to the conversation, it's the, that's the focused conversation of like, what did you guys notice? Um, what did we like? What should we try next time? That was a great way to also bring in those people that I had spent so much time like building trust with in person during the summer. Um, and this actually, I mean, I've, this has allowed me to collaborate with them more in like more meaningful ways than some of the teachers at my school because of the filming and video chat functions. So that part was definitely, um, wouldn't have happened without technology. And thank you. Questions from the audience? Um, I appreciate hearing this. This is really quite interesting. And I, I do a lot of professional development work myself. And I've always noticed the huge difference between professional development that's voluntary, where people choose to come, versus the district assigned PD that often you are, teachers are subjected to, and we are in front of the teachers who are subjected to. And I'm wondering how you see this translating into that context. Um, district um, had instructional coaches that were going to do 
see something like this, I could see that probably would not be so difficult. Something like that. Like, but I feel like the follow the follow up that was really key, and the technology allowed that to be a little bit easier. To add on to that, I think the big piece um, one of our participants said earlier is about giving teachers more autonomy and more choice, and I think that's really important. Uh, one of the the local high schools that I work at. Uh, the staff has moved to PLCs in which staff had choice in selecting that and I was working with the new teachers and I've been able to take some of these pieces that, that I use with Hollyhock to that school site. So I, I think we need to be, we need to uh, think differently about the professional learning that's happening at our, at our school sites where teachers have more um, choice and just they're part of the decision making process. The challenge, and I agree completely with teachers as professionals having choice. I think one of the challenges for any of us is we don't always know what we don't know. And so I think there's a little bit of an art to bridging the thing you think you want with the thing you haven't even thought about. Um, and that, that's a piece of that whole transformative PD and really trying to create the cognitive dissonance. Because if you don't start where people are and what they think they want, you're not going to get anywhere. Um, and I'm, I'm not a big fan of district mandates, but I've done PD under those circumstances, and you can make it work, because somewhere over here it was survey the teachers, collect the assessment. You know, you can, there are at least entry points like that. And as a coach and someone that actually provides a professional development, you know, it, it's really important to know, I think we've said it a couple times, to know who the teachers are that are coming in. So when we meet the teachers, when they first arrive in the very first cohort, the very first day, we are gathering a lot of information that we didn't necessarily have until they show up. And we make adjustments. We think, well, the ultimate goals don't change. But we may need to think about what, what do we need to do to get teachers there. And that might look different within the 20 people you have in front of you. And we might have to differentiate and say, well, what is going to happen at their context? So what does this school need? What does this teacher need? And I think that, but the goals didn't change for us. It's just how we adapted to get there. Let's see if Amber can work on I really appreciated the perspective of trying to keep teachers in the classroom. Um, as a former teacher myself, I very much appreciate that goal. And I'm just wondering what the connection is between high quality teacher PD and retaining teachers. It, is there any evidence showing that effective PD leads to um, greater teacher sustainability or greater teacher appreciation? And what's the connection there? From a literature point of view, I don't think it's well developed yet. Um, I think there's, if you look at the um, sort of exit surveys of why people leave, lack of appreciation, couldn't control my classroom. I mean, there's some things that you could hint at that PD could make a difference. Um, Katie, sir, er, Katie, Sadie is our case study tonight. And um, currently, we have a growing set of cases from the Hollyhock Fellowship of people that are telling, because we ask a baseline and then repeated survey set of questions of how long do you think you'll stay in teaching? And we're seeing the numbers drift upwards. Um, we haven't done enough analysis that I'm going to make some great proclamation, but it's got some very promising implications to it. Um, let's see, there's one more thing I was going to say related to that. I lost it. But yeah, Katie, do you want to add? Yeah, I can definitely add to that. Um, I mean, currently, I don't really have any interest in being in administration, um, like at all. Um, but I, I love teaching, and I feel like um, with good professional development, it just it makes me like my job even more because I have like more tools. I feel more comfortable. Like I'm more effective. So, and also the support is there, and it's nice to have that like outside um, view of support. So it's not support coming from like my department head or something else like that. It's like a completely unbiased party who is um, helping me be a better teacher. So helping me be a better teacher makes me enjoy my job more. Therefore, I'm gonna be a teacher longer. That's kind of how I see it. I know what I wanted to add because I think it adds some context to the the early data that we're starting to see out of Hollyhock. The Hollyhock Fellowship is targeted at teachers in high need schools. They have to be in a school that has 50% or more of their kids qualifying for free and reduced lunch. We actually average 80% or more in our student population. They also have to be early career. Um, no, let's see, having finished second, 
year and not having started seventh, and our average is three and a half years. So, you know, the ideal thing is we want to watch these cohorts of roughly 100 each and see over time how many stay in the profession, because that's going to be one more way to look at evidence. Right now we have self-report that pe more people are planning to stay longer now, two years later, than when they entered the fellowship. Hi, I was um, <clears throat> I was listening to what Janet, what you were saying in terms of um, using research-based practices for the fellowship, and I'm wondering how Hollyhock incorporates or cultivates um, a sense of innovation. I mean, if you're basing it on what's been tried and proven already, um, how do you cultivate that innovative spirit? that might actually lead to some really good breakthroughs in teaching and learning? I'll give you my I help lead the program answer, but then I want you guys to ground it, okay? <laughs> um, I'd like to think, but this is the proof down here, that we're providing a skeleton of core practices, and we really do focus very much on um, helping students make sense in discussions and helping teachers work on those moves. Um, there's a couple other layers of core practices, but that's our dominant one. That by owning that skeleton, you, the individual teacher, can personalize and innovate so that those parts of the skeleton can come out in the shape of a cat, a chimpanzee, a, a whatever, and then you flesh it out with your own personality and style. I mean, the last thing I want to do is a bunch of Stepford Wives teachers by saying these are the practices. I'd like to think there's more professionalism and flexibility in there, but I'd love to hear from the rest of you what you think. Yeah, I, I can give one concrete example. One thing I would just say, it's the community, especially with the content cluster. And like, I think with the video, you're able to show t other teachers things that they might not have thought before and being able to bounce ideas. So a, a core practice that we talk a lot about is discussion. And one of the fellows that I'm working with um, we were talking about back channeling, like how can you increase participation of discussion, and um, and through conversations, this teacher um, had a back channel in their Socratic seminar. And for those of you who are not familiar with back channeling, it's what some of you are doing on Twitter right now. Um, you have students who are participating in discussion um, online while you have your inner circle who is talking out loud. And like that wouldn't have been possible without us meeting as a group. And so this teacher sharing this practice, you know, she was able to share that out in our community and, and now other teachers are interested in, in, in doing that. And me, it was really exciting. I got to sit in on one of these back channels and I'm commenting um, with her students. And so, so that's just like one example. I think being able to create a space where teachers are able to share ideas. And we also have video where I feel it, it pushes teachers to want to try new things that they hear their colleagues are doing. I think one thing that really sticks out in my mind is that say, when Sadie and I talk, we talk about um, being thought partners. And so we might be working on a particular strategy, but we're trying all sorts of things to get for that particular class period or for certain groups of students or for just the idea we want our, our students to talk more in class discussions. Um, remember the card sort? We yeah. tried to do like, let's try it card sort. Let's try it this way. Let's try it that way. I think part of this was that there was a safety built in to just be okay with trying some things and, and then we'll record it and see how it goes. Yeah, but I would say like at the core, like that's a, that's a thing that makes a good teacher a good teacher is you're always adapting. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about potential, we also are talking about scale, and I'm seeing kind of like, this is expensive PD, am I correct? And so is there how much is that, and really is this kind of scalable at, you know, a bigger level in terms of that? So being responsible for the fundraising, yes, it is a little <laughs> bit expensive. However, we've done some cost analysis. It costs less to have a teacher participate in the two years of Hollyhock than it costs the average urban district to recruit a new teacher to replace each one that leaves. In, um, so we're about half the cost of what it costs to replace a teacher. Um, we are working to bring the cost down. We're still, we're doing program development as we're teaching it. So we're probably about a year, I 
I would yeah. say, from feeling like the program is solidly developed because mm -hmm. we're iterating as we go. Um, so yes, initial investment high. If our data plays out, well worth it. So as, I don't, a, as, as a benchmark, yeah. you know what I'm saying? But I think of the professional yeah. development as moving practice from, the, one of the reasons we're focusing on your early career is that's, if you've made it to year three, you've gotten some handle on classroom management, all right? So now, I, a broad statement, but <laughs> roughly true. Um, now, what can we do to really focus on instruction for learning? And that's what brings the joy back into why you went into teaching. So yeah, the PD is on the instruction, but we're trying to build something else that mm -hmm. creates that love of the profession. And I think another key in Hollyhock is the teamness, both at your site, across your content area, and then in your cohort. We have two bi-coastal relationships right now that we started through the um, <laughs> Hollyhock Fellowship. We've got, um, now in our third cohort, we've got multiple urban areas where we have rings of Hollyhock Fellows. So if we can sustain our momentum with funding, we can actually start to have a footprint that makes a difference in some of the places where teacher turnover is absolutely at its worst. Can I, can I share a few things about the, the regional kind of aspect of building community? So we've only had two cohorts so far go through, and we're expecting our third this summer, and yet, our regional cohort, so we have a whole group of teachers in the New York area. They get together on their own. They meet, they, they arrange times, right, to, to meet and um, talk about their practice, get together, make sure they're staying connected, they share resources. Um, within content areas, we've established, we've, we have a place, um, a portal, where, where teachers can upload resources for each other. So um, we have some science teachers that they change preps, so they're teaching biology and now they're teaching chemistry. And they have to start again. They reach out to other fellows who say, you know what, I'm gonna walk you through all of my chemistry units so that you're not alone. And so, uh, so just on their own, I feel like the teachers have really taken this up to build the supports that they need themselves, something that we started with, but they're really taking it upon themselves to continue. And I think that helps um, sustain and give them energy and gives them the support so that we're not it's, not, it's not always coming from me. One other thing I'd like to add to that is just still being rooted in a high school. I've tried to experiment with some of the practices we do at Hollyhock at the school level and having been an instructional coach um, for a district last year where it was all in-person coaching. Um, one thing that I found uh, pretty effective is not for every, every meeting, but some meetings I'll, I'll, I can do a Google Hangout with teachers instead of when I had to drive from school to school in order to meet with teachers. And then also, um, when I've built a relationship with, this, um, with teachers to have them record, there's something about, um, I actually think when you can have a video, a representation of the classroom, it actually can help build trust with the teacher because before when I was an instructional coach, teachers really relying on my interpretation of what I saw in the classroom. So uh, it's, it's pretty interesting to like build this culture where you know, teachers feel comfortable with having their room recorded and we have this um, common um, experience that we're talking about. So I'm really interested in thinking about some of the things that we do in Hollyhock, how we can bring that to districts where they've made investments in instructional coaching programs. I think that was some of my questions. Um, I think this program is really nice, but um, I'm a little bit surprised about it. I'm new in this country, there's maybe another view. Um, maybe is it possible for senior teachers to have that coaching role in their schools or in their districts uh, as a different career path, but not only the, um, the principal way, but maybe this path in their schools? more of a teacher support 
in preparation model, but part of my role in that is um, I am a mentor teacher right now, so I have a student teacher, and I could see what you're saying, like where if I was the like instructional leader for my school, I could do the same thing as my coach does. Um, yeah, that's that is a great idea. I could see I could see how that would work, and that that would probably interest me a little bit more, like than being an administrator, as long as I didn't have to stop teaching. And I think it's one of the ways for us to leverage the program. As Tammy mentioned, we're just finishing year two. So we're starting to see the potential of what can happen. And it's another way to leverage aspects of the program without as high a cost directly to districts. So, because the capacity doesn't have to stay at three thousand. You see, there's no reason we can't teach other people to do these things. So. Um, you mentioned how this could affect retention. And I'm wondering how it could affect teacher retention in terms of not just the profession, but staying in their districts. Do teachers have to have a commitment after this program to stay in high need schools? Do you foresee teachers going through this program and then leaving their district? Some will. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the reasons we have teams come from schools is to help build that commitment in the school and to that district. Um, it's a risk. By, we don't have any way to leverage uh, you have to stay in that same school two years later. We are really strict while you're in the program. That, is, that seems like a really hard question because, um, yeah, because I know like one of the reasons why I wanted to teach science was for the population of students that I teach right now. Um, but it's true that um, my, my salary could be significantly higher if I chose to go somewhere else. But I mean, then again, that's, you don't get any teachers base salary. So I feel like building the community yeah, that's a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're going next? Okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you quirk my, a lot of people go into administration because they feel there is more money in that. Uh, and they do come from the classroom. And I do, I have met lots of, a couple of our administrators have been a principal for seven years and they went back to the classroom because of that. So are, is there any financial backing of someone who would be a senior or a mentor or an incentive uh, to the program to where if you had years of experience and you were working with this and you were doing, doing it with technology, that you could be at a level, a higher financial level because you were a mentor or be made that way? That's one question. union and setting of salaries thing, but your salary doesn't go very go up very much just with years of experience if you need another jump somehow. And yeah, that would definitely help with retention, I'm sure. The other yeah. model we're playing around at CSED is um, leading teachers who stay in the classroom during the year, but then during the summer evenings, weekends, work <laughs> with us and do other things that we compensate them for. Not tonight. Sadie's here for dinner. Right. Uh. Uh, my other thing is just an observance for the potential for broadening access. I, sometimes I just walk around to see how other people's classrooms look, or I wonder, does this child act the same way in this a teacher's class as they do mine? Or what is, uh, does, how does one teacher, uh, I walk into their classroom and they're totally quiet and I walk into another one and they're like bouncing off the wall. So I think it's, it would be very advantageous to be able to look into each other's classrooms just to see how one subject or one thing may be presented and how each one does it. Um, at our school, we do have collaboration time. Unfortunately, I'm at another campus when they're having collaboration time, but they do really have think tanks and work on different things. So bringing technology into it where they could say, well, I'm really good at presenting you know, our new map thing we're doing. So they could actually videotape it and then look at that lesson plan and then be able to pass it on to another teacher. So that would be, I think when you work with a teacher that is invested in the same way you are, that then the quality of your teaching goes up because you, you, have, you feel free to ask questions about it. You feel free to say, hi, I wanna learn about this. 
One thing I had thought about before I knew about this program was teacher swap. You wouldn't have to pay for a sub. I would go to your class, you'd go to my class. Maybe a high school teacher would go to a middle school English class to see what they're learning in middle school to get ready for high school and vice versa to prepare. So I thought about that. One there and one there. Are you gonna, are you gonna oh, speak to that? Or um, are you gonna? I, I actually know um, creative principals who set up swaps so that people can see either within a building or across a district. So it's, you know, anything that deprivatizes practice and makes practice public, I think works to the advantage of kids. And we have teachers right now that are in the program that involve their entire school and saying, see, this is what I'm doing with Hollyhock. I think we should all watch each other on video and it becomes part of their PLC. The outside of us is something that they bring back to their own setting. And we have, like we said, we have school teams and the teams are interdisciplinary. So it's not always all a, a complete science team. It's science, English, math. Or, and so they, like Sadie, Sadie has a partner who, um, Sarah, who's math, and they not only share with the coach, but they share with each other. Yeah, we both shared our videos at the partner meeting because one of our focuses was um, introducing academic discussion. And you might not think of that as a natural place in a math or a science class. So some of our departments were wondering, like, when and where and how do you, you know, throw in academic discussion, like whole class academic so we, I've showed video clips at um, department meetings and I know Sarah has too. Mm -hmm. I like your analogy of um, the skeleton of a cat or whatever and you're just, you're building it. Um, I, I see education over the years, um, 21 plus teaching, administration, plus support staff early on. And I see it more as little lady lives in a, in a little old shoe and she's, and everything's getting shoved in this shoe. And, um, you know, it's, it's difficult, I think, for um, teachers as professionals to um, multitask to the nth degree. They're trying to um, establish their um, position in any district and just to receive tenure. And then as they reach that period of rejuvenation where they're gonna get burnt out and decide on another, um, position or another school site, I think it could be very overwhelming and, and I really appreciate the fact that many administrators who have gone into the profession, um, not just for the money, but because they've been in that position of a teacher where they were on that overload and they wanted to make it actually better for the next guy. So I appreciate that um, they put those efforts in to have different um, types of opportunities for teachers to grow as professionals by having teacher enrichment, which, you know, support teachers where they can network after school, they'll buy them dinner, you know, and um, sometimes it's paid or not paid depending on if the funding is there. But I think they, um, they really make that effort. The other is, um, I think that um, there are other um, cohorts such as the, um, through the Department of Ed, where they have the subject matter projects where you can be just within your own uh, subject matter and then really take it to that fine tune point of your curriculum. So um, I just wanted to say, I think, I think it's awesome that you're having this to where we can establish, because I think everyone's, I don't really see whole, um, you know, districts here, I see little from all over the places you mapped out. And um, I just wish that we could be little pods or, or plant seeds within our district to grow within that for um, the future. Thanks. Uh, so as someone who was a practicing site administrator, I feel like I need to apologize. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but also to say that uh, I think I was a decent high school English teacher, and the reason I went into administration was because I wanted to have a greater impact on more students and in programs and with teachers and to be able to mentor and, and support more of my colleagues. That being said, uh, so the Hollyhock program, fellowship program, um, I heard you mention, Janet, that it is um, – that you encourage teams from schools to attend. My first question is, um, 
is it an expectation or a, a desired qualification that somebody from the leadership team be included in that? Um, mostly I think about how as a site administrator, I had a lot of flexibility. I could have gone into any classroom and chose to go into classrooms to co-teach with teachers, to, to work with them, to do much of the coaching. That is not part of the program to become an administrator. And so, um, so my first question is, is there a desire or, or any part of the vision that, that encourages that? And then the second part to that is what does exist for people who are effective teachers, maybe they choose to go into administration for all the right reasons and now they need the support that I see teachers getting a lot of. And I do, and I know that's you know somewhat blasphemy, but relative to administrators, teachers get a boatload of support. So just having, not that any of it is enough, but everyone who's in administration, but they've got a principal fellowship program, right. which um, I think is, it's not the thing you do to get your administrative right. certificate. Um, and then we have a superintendent's program in concert with the Graduate School of Business. So I think those are the formal structures. Currently, Hollyhock does not include administrators because it's the original conception of the fellowship program. But in Hollyhock 2.0, <laughs> I really want a, both parallel and intertwined. There's a part of what we do that is, I think, very important for the fellows to be away from anything that has sm could smack of evaluation or someone who is in a position to evaluate you. On the other hand, imagine what could be happening in the school if those administrators understood the work that their teachers are doing in the summer and then through the school year. So my grand vision does include <laughs> administrators. We're just not there yet. That was that was one distinction that I thought about too because so um, when you first said leadership team I was thinking like we do have designated like instructional leaders sort of but it's by default it's whoever's been teaching the longest at that school is like your instructional leader for say biology or whatever um, and that doesn't always match up with like who is who could be an actual instructional leader and so when it comes to like being a true leader at your school that's one reason why I wish our administrators were more like um, in tune with this program and what we were doing because they can't always, like when it's like, well, I would love to share with more of what I did at Hollyhock and then the actual instructional leader is like, well, no, I wanted to do this then. And then, you know, so if our administrators were more in tune with like the work that we were doing, I feel like we could have more of an impact, but some of those systems I don't have any control over, like who is designated the instructional leader versus who wants to share instruction with us and grade. The other program we're developing as a result of the work that our coaches are doing is a program about how to coach using video-based practice representation. So that one, we're, we're moving faster on that than we are on the, how are we gonna get the administrators there? Hi, I think we're all aware that there's a teacher shortage in the Valley and so what's alarming and what's b happening these days is that you know we're, we're trying to find quality teacher leaders. There are a lot of teacher uh, TOSAs now, teachers on special assignment, that have been teaching for less than five years. And they have come up to the ranks and we're finding that some of our teacher uh, coaches don't necessarily have the pearls of wisdom that someone who's had 15 years of teaching or um, even um, have the content uh, knowledge base that some of our teachers should have before they become um, teacher leaders. How do you address that in your program? I would say you should want to take them to Hollyhock, but that's just <laughs> <laughs> No, I think, I mean, that speaks to you as an early adopter of using educational technology, like opportunities opened up. Um, you know, I, I became a, a library media teacher um, and found myself uh, in that position. Then it was training teachers for technology. So there is a definite need in terms of how we can better support teachers. And I think it really goes back to the, the plan that we're developing and being able to share our practice and, and also just the, like in this room there's such rich expertise, like if we were to um, 
tally up all of the years that people have been teaching. And so I think models in which it's not, it's not about the tech. So Bridget is always sharing. It's never about the tech, right? It, it's about the plans that we have for implementation and the leadership. And I think um, when we were talking about admin, admin play a very critical role in that. And, and another thing too I would say is like when we're developing teacher leadership, how can we keep teachers in the classroom? You know, as um, I began taking out on different roles. It, was, it got harder and harder to stay in the classroom. And last year, in an as an instructional coach, um, it was a challenge for me to teach. That you know, to, in order to take the role as an instructional coach, I couldn't be in the classroom. And this year, I'm able to teach one class, and it makes a difference. It makes a difference when you're able to talk. You're in the classroom, and you're talking to teachers that you're coaching. Um, so that's really ground. So I think that it's about like looking different, thinking differently um, about how we're creating teacher leaders um, at our school. Yeah. Also, as a former reformed administrator, um, <laughs> I, I wanted to kind of yeah, I, I wanted to kind of get back to the admin piece as part of the Hollyhock program, do you outreach to those administrators? Do you let them know what those people are doing and so that they have an awareness of what the teachers are going through and what and what kinds of things they're actually learning in the program? Because I think that something, it wasn't implicitly stated, but I think it's also important um, for a systematic review that those principals and those administrators on site understand what's going on so that they can be that teacher leader or be able to support those people. So I will confess, sending an email, sending a link to a website, you know, these are busy people with full inboxes. So yes, we have communication. Um, we do also try to empower the fellows to help to go back and talk to their administrators. Um, I will also tell you, there's a fair amount of administrator turnover in the schools that we're working with. Yeah. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, ultimately, we've got to get to this vision where the administrators are part of the program. Um, but yeah, we, we don't pretend they don't exist. So as a former, I, I was a school administrator as well, um, and I stayed very, very connected with classroom practice. Um, and so, you know, through the different, for, through the many years, I, I ended up here somehow. Mm -hmm. And loving my job working with teachers. I think one of the things that we do at Hollyhock is that we work with the teams and the teams that go back to their school sites, they have goals for what they want to do in their classrooms and in their schools. A lot of the team coaching conversations are around um, this idea of teacher leadership. So how do they, from whatever position they're in, whether they're a classroom teacher and that's all they do, or if they're a department head or whatever kind of other things, roles that they have at their school, we, we talk about what is their sphere of influence? Who do they need to align with? Who do they need to talk to? If there's certain things happening at the school, then, then especially if it's a very large, comprehensive school, you have to be able to find the partners and then figure out what to do as a team for next steps. And so those are, that's part of the team conversation. If you want the school culture to change, who do you have to have in alignment with you? Who do you have to develop relationships with? Who's the one administrator or two administrators or dean of students that you can talk to about the work and invite them in? So it is very much a part of our, um, of our program, but it comes up very specifically in the context of each school we work with because it's national and we have schools that are um, large comprehensive public schools to small charters. And so it depends on the school and what the, what the team has decided their goal would be. One last comment. Hi, um, I'm speaking as a school board member in a public school district in um, the South Bay. You know, just the fact that we're talking about um, districts that have instructional coaches <clears throat> or the position of a TOSA or anything just shows that leadership in the district is aware of the need and you're absolutely right <clears throat> in saying that how do you help navigate through the process if it isn't there. Mm -hmm. So I, th that's a great opportunity because it is very difficult to navigate whether it's a small district or even a big district. How do you change the culture? How do you change the mindset? How do you help people understand who are making those financial decisions um, that this is an important role or this is an important shift that needs to be made in a system. 
Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. that was rhetorical, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I think so, we're about yeah. at time. So Angela has some wrap-up slides. Okay. Yes, I do. And I think that's a great point where tech technology has a real potential for leverage, and I think that's in part of making our practice public, right? Um, and, and that we have videos where we can have representations and we can share the work that we're doing as well. So real opportunity there. Um, all right, here's that exit ticket. Uh, we appreciate if you could give us feedback about the session. We share these questions. Is this one on too? No, okay, we, um, we, we love sharing and reading these questions uh, with our future, uh, or with um, our presenters. And so you can go to the short UL bit.ly uh, EDF equity. And then a reminder, I'm really excited. I'm, oh, this, this seminar has been fantastic. I can't believe we're going to be in week seven uh, next week. Um, so if you haven't done so already, please register online for um, equity in making and creating. Um, we have a fantastic panel. Um, we also, um, our lightning speaker, um, Corinne, who is going to have a pop-up where we're going to actually be able to um, um, get our make on, so we'll be able to, to build a couple of things as well. So please, if you haven't done so already, make sure you register here. And then um, th I, there was a question about just opportunities, and, and now I'm thinking of an app, right, where you can have opportunities for administrators and teachers, someone get on that, of, of what's available. We're really lucky tonight that um, members from the Kraus Center of Innovation are here. Again, I was saying, for me, like really feeling isolated in the classroom and thinking about how I was using educational technology it was uh, places like Kraus Center of Innovation that really gave me a community to think about how to use um, educational technology meaningfully. And we have a couple of people from the Merit Program who are also here to facilitate the Campfire Chats. The Campfire Chats are all about professional learning, whether you're doing it online or in person. If we could have our facilitator stand up so we can just see who you are. All right, fantastic. Let's give them a round of applause. Um, the campfire chats have been fantastic in a way of building community, so I encourage you to um, grab some food, um, take a seat at the table, and you'll get to continue conversation that started here. Um, but do not uh, uh, grab the food until you fill out our exit ticket. <laughs> and um, I want to thank all of you again for joining us this evening for Education's um, Digital Future Equity by Design. I look forward to seeing you next week as well. Thank you. <laughs>